Welcome back to TV Studio 5. For our next session, we will move to the front lines of conservation and development in the Guiana Shield of South America. Spanning over 270 million hectares over six South American countries, the Guiana Shield is the largest remaining tract of primary forest on Earth. The forests are 90% intact, but under pressures from mining, logging, agriculture, and recent oil discoveries are raising the question of how to pursue development in the region. How can we conserve these precious ter terrestrial ecosystems in face of the pressures of development? The answer may lie with the people who call this forest home. This session will be moderated by Damian Fernandez, Senior Advisor of Communication, Strategy and Development at Conservation International Guyana. He will be joined by John Hutzhalk, Executive Director of Conservation International Suriname. And we will also hear from Gwendolyn Smith from Perspectives of Freedom Foundation, an expert in conflict analysis and resolution, environmental and international development, and working with tribal and indigenous communities. Please note the extra point for joining us at 4.50 a.m. in their local time. So without further ado, Damian, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, you're live. Okay. I just want to welcome the audience and the panelists to our discussion on the environmental opportunities available in the Ghana Shield. Um, we have a Slido poll that we would like you to participate in. I could, if you can put that up. Um, uh, basically, the question, what does Guyana mean, the Guyana and the Guyana Shield? And we'll get to the look at some of those answers shortly. Um, but it falls on me to really introduce the audience this morning to the Guyana Shield. So I don't know if we can put up the um, PowerPoint presentation now. The Ghana Shield, as, as, as I mentioned, next, please. Now, one of the um, interesting things about the Ghana Shield is that it's been known in literature for many years as the lost world. And one of the challenges of being the lost world is finding it on a map. <laughs> next, please. Um, and basically, the Guyana Shield is the hidden is hidden in the Amazonian forest in the one third um, section of the forest to the north of the continent. And next, please. It's called the Lost World for a reason. It's ancient. It's some of the oldest formations on Earth, um, almost two billion years old. And it has landscapes like this in Canaima National Park in uh, Venezuela. This is the tallest waterfall on Earth. Next, please. And it's continuous, contiguous to these formations. These are the Tapuis of the Guyana Shield. Um, and they're, in essence, mountains in the sky, if you will. This is Mount Roraima, which forms the border between Guyana, Brazil, and Venezuela. Um, on that mountain, um, there's a toad that lives nowhere else on Earth called the Roraima toad. And even in the indigenous cultures of the area, this is supposed to be the stump of the world tree that was cut down by man and out of which flowed a flood that filled the rivers with fish and water. Next, please. And that, that imagery of forests and water is really what defines the Guyana Shield. Um, it is basically located between the Arnaco and the Amazon. It's about 170, uh, 177 million hectares, or about the size of Germany, France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Spain, and Portugal combined. And it's the largest tract of primary forest left on Earth. Um, but to really understand the nature of the Ghana Shield, we need to kind of lift this layer of green. Next, please. And what you'll see is 
this formation I was this I was speaking of. Next, please. The red and the yellows show you the highlands of that this area, and the purples and uh, pinks show the lowlands. And the Guyana Shield, and particularly these three countries and territories, which is Guyana, Suriname, and French Guyana, they are actually separate hydrologically from the Amazon. Water that falls on these ridges actually fall, flow north into these countries and out into the Atlantic. Um, and this, this really has created a biological barrier between the Amazon and the Guyana Shield and caused a lot of species to emerge in the Guyana Shield that, that existed nowhere else, uh, exists nowhere else. Can, next please. And that barrier held for, for millennia, uh, for, for millions of years, uh, except for in the area shown in red, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But what in essence that is, is a hidden canyon system that allowed for movement of animals and biodiversity across these two distinct ecozones. Next, please. Next. So these are the species that are kind of known in, in mostly in the Amazon, the giant otter, the arapaima, the um, black caiman, giant river turtle, and giant Amazon lilies, these are really um, moved into this the Guyana Shield through this hidden canyon system and has now created this kind of overflow of biodiversity in places like the Rupununi in Guyana um, in particular. Next, please. Um, these are just some examples of some of the endemics. Fish uh, in particular, there, there are very high levels of um, fish diversity in the Guyana Shield. Some rivers contain the entire genera from nowhere else on Earth. One of those fish, next please, is this monster, which is the Arapaima, the Guyanese Arapaima. This moved over from the Brazilian system millions of years ago, and scientists are now discovering that it has become its own species. This happens to also be an important economic uh, activity for indigenous communities in this area because they have now entered the uh, sports fishing arena where you can sports fish for this fish as opposed to killing it and eating it. Next, please. Of course, this has really taken a huge impact with COVID. And one of the drawbacks of being the lost world or in a landscape like this that is very... Um, untouched and raw is that you are often isolated from services and a lot of indigenous people particularly now are feeling this because of um, flooding that's happening lack of access to some um, medical services across the the, the region um, it's a challenge really that that has always been an issue for a lot of the residents of the Guyanas next please and now, combined with that, is this emergence of infrastructure on the landscape, starting to connect this lost world with the rest of Brazil and South America. And this is really um, intersecting, development is intersecting with natural systems. This is a, a, an example of the Rupununi floodplain, as well as indigenous people and some of their vulnerabilities. Next, please. So Guyana is the, the Guyana Shield rather is is mostly the um, northern part of the Amazon in Brazil, uh, as well as the three Guyanas and um, and parts of Venezuela. Next, please. Um, and as you can see, that line snaking up the, its way there, that is the road from Brazil moving towards the Guyana Shield. So. Pressures are not just coming from the coast where most of the population lives. It's coming from the southern side, uh, which is from Brazil. So we are really approaching a decade here that will determine what happens to the last, uh, the last largest remaining track of primary tropical rainforest in the world. Next, please. And some of the considerations there really um, 
not just apply to indigenous issues on the south, which you'll hear more from John about and um, as well as from Gwendolyn, but there's an interesting phenomenon that has shaped our coast as well. Next, please. To understand that, we need to go to the mouth of the Amazon. Next, please. And this is an image uh, frozen in time of the amount of silt that the Amazon is dumping into the Atlantic. It's about the size of the Netherlands, that, that plume of mud, much deeper, of course, and it is being pushed along the coast of South America towards French Guiana, Suriname, and Guyana. This mud is actually responsible for some of the youngest land on the continent. Next, please. Which is basically the Atlantic coast of the Guyana Shield. And that is made up of mud that is eroded from the entire northern section of um, South America. All of the countries of the Amazon basically pumping um, sediment into the ocean, which is then um, being pulled by currents to French Guiana, Suriname, and Guyana. Next, please. And what happens there, and this is an image of the coast of Suriname, um, mangroves actually reach out and start to colonize mud banks that are slowly passing the shore and generating new lands in Suriname. These areas to the north are called the Young Coastal Plain. Uh, and it's really um, in contrast to the old parts of the Guyana Shield, which is some of the oldest on Earth, these coastal plains are some of the youngest pieces of land on Earth. And they're made through this natural machine and mud conveyor belt. The machine is the mangrove system. The, and the conveyor belt of mud is providing the materials for the mangrove to build new land. Next, please. In Guyana, we've lost a lot of our uh, coastal mangrove fringes, but learning from Suriname and with support from the EU, we've actually uh, been able to change the situation. Next, please. And we've begun to grow grow back mangrove fridges along our coast, protecting important agricultural lands. Next, please. And this is just an idea of what it looks like. The mud is passing from the Amazon and in the ocean, the, and the mangroves are reaching out and capturing what they can as mud, these mud banks and mud flats pass. So mangroves, in essence, are giving us a natural climate solution here, not just for the storage of carbon, but the creation of new land on this coast. And we at CI are looking to use machine learning potentially and track some of this uh, uh, movement of silt along this coast so that we can better uh, predict areas that are likely to be captured by mangroves. Um, and in, in, in the end, we're actually expanding a coast rather than retreating during uh, climate change and rising sea levels. Next, please. So there are multiple options. We're looking in different countries across the region. It is really the one of the few places on Earth where you can combine green and gray approaches to sea level, uh, sea defense construction at scale, at a national scale at this point in time. So it, it is, um, it is a, a, a area that we're pursuing very strongly in these coming years. Next thing. Because one of the things that have happened to the Guyana Shield is all of this mud and this organic matter long, a long time ago formed some of the largest remaining oil reserves on the planet. Um, and Guyana has already begun to pump oil for the first time in its history, and Suriname is well on its way as well. Um, and what really happens now to this area with some of the lowest uh, population density figures on Earth? Um, what happens to this space? Next. Next, please. The good thing is that both in Guyana with its low carbon development strategy and in Suriname, next with the passage of new legislation. Next, please. The, there is a 
strong um, opportunity in both countries and across the region to explore a green model of growth, um, one that uh, combines different traditional and new innovative approaches to, to addressing this climate change, um, the, the challenges we're facing. And next, please. And in the end, really, it's for us, um, it's about these people here, the residents of the Guyana Shield, um, which is another one of its distinguishing characteristics. We are uh, a mix of people that trace their ancestry from across the world, whether it be Africa or India, the islands of Java or Madeira, from China to the Middle East, and that's just the beginning of the story. Um, it's, it's really populations that have lived in this lost world that have struggled and now have this opportunity with oil to move out of the shadow of their past and explore their own development. And we need to be there to provide nature-based solutions for that development for the people that depend on it. So that's it from me. Um, I don't know if we can show the results of the poll. <laughs> All right, it's the interesting spread. Um, Ghana actually means the land of many waters, which is one of the challenges we now find ourselves in because most of our countries are facing severe flooding due to La Nina in the Pacific. Um, but I think to talk more about some of the uh, opportunities and challenges in Suriname, I'd like to ask John to take the floor. And um, we're going to be uh, accepting questions in the question and answer uh, option, and we will address them at the end of the session. Go ahead, John. Thank you very much, Damien. So, um... You know, Damien, it was really nice seeing the overview of our beautiful countries again. And um, every time I see it, I get happy, but I also get a little bit sad when I uh, think about, you know, some of the challenges we're dealing with. And, um, you know, let's, let, let's start out the slide deck and, and let's show the people what it is that's going on in, in the Guyana Shield and certainly in Suriname in this case. So really what we've been struggling with, and I think the entire shield, but certainly Suriname, is we've been figuring out how do we actually balance conservation of our natural capital with economic and social development. And, and sadly, it, it's often being framed as a, as a dichotomy, which I think is a false dichotomy, because I don't think it's about choosing nature or economics. That's kind of like saying, choosing between life or living, right? Because without nature, there is no humanity. And I do think it's important that as we develop on our path, we really keep that focus front and center. So next, please. So as I indicated, we are struggling to find and maintain that balance. Um, now in Suriname, looking at the forest cover we have, which is 93%, some would say we've done a fairly good job so far. And, and I agree to some extent. However, we do have some challenges that we're dealing with right now. So uh, please show me the next slide. So for the entire shield and certainly for Suriname, some of the issues we're dealing with here relate to some of the, um, the sectors that we, uh, that we depend on, like gold and, um, and forestry, also known as logging or timber. Those are some of the things that currently feed, uh, feed our families and they help um, provide for our infrastructure. So while we do that, we are struggling to really ensure that we preserve these areas of high conservation value, certainly in the face of climate change. Now, the interesting thing about climate change and about Suriname and Guyana is that even though Guyana and Suriname have historically contributed um, some of the least we are one of the most vulnerable countries. Now, of course, this is a story that we've heard before, um, but the fact is that certainly in Suriname, we are, most of us living at, on the coast, and those, those coasts are drowning. 
um, as they are currently. We've been dealing with floods over the past uh, month or two, just like Damien indicated, um, that are incredibly disruptive and are uh, right now during COVID crisis limiting our ability to respond to this crisis. And then finally, um, we also uh, need to really improve our land and biodiversity management. And these are strained because of lack of resources and lack of academic and scientific institutions in the country. Next slide, please. So Suriname, what, what, what exactly does that look like? Um, for those who've never been, you know, it's probably hard to imagine, but as I just indicated, we have 93% forest cover. That means that with our small population, we have almost 30 hectares of forest per person. That puts us at number one, period, period point blank. We have the most forest per person, yet we are struggling <laughs> to really to make ends meet. So really we are very keen at finding ways to, to solve that conundrum, to solve that puzzle. How do we maintain our forests and our biodiversity while empowering the growth of our communities and our people. So we've got 30 hectares of forest to work with. What else do we have? Well, we have 10% of world's fresh water in rivers. It's amazing. That's an incredible number. Just think about that. This tiny country, I think we're the smallest country in terms of land mass in all of South America, with only half a million people. And we actually have 10% of the world's fresh water in rivers. Not to mention the vast tracts of mangroves. Last time I checked, I think it was over 100,000 hectares of mangroves that are helping to keep our coast safe. So the greatest biodiversity. Um, every couple of years, we do expeditions to the deep south of Suriname, which is really uh, getting, getting near the, um, let's say, the, the heart of the Amazon for us, certainly, of Amazonia. And every time we discover new species on top of the high levels of endemism that we already have. So it's beautiful to see what all is harbored in Surinamese forests. Then we've got our big trees um, maintaining huge amounts of carbon storage. Some of the biggest carbon storage trees grow right here in the Guyana Shield and are kept safe by us, by the communities. The communities really are the stewards of the forest. And without them, there really is no way to, to really enable forests to be maintained or even improved in the fight against climate change. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we're dealing with right now, as Damien indicated, is Suriname is poised to become one of the largest oil producers in the world per capita, in any case. Huge stores have been found. And really what we're, what we're looking to find out now is how do we, in fact, ensure that we, we see the economic benefits that this, um, this new industry can bring for us. But how do we avoid losing our mangroves? How do we ensure that the newfound wealth or newfound economic um, powers we'll be having don't lead to rampant destruction of our, of our forests uh, through maybe you know, insufficiently planned infrastructure or urbanization or any of these things that are really kind of looming um, on the horizon for us? And how do we maintain the health of our communities, the most important stewards of forests worldwide? And it's no different here in Suriname. So again, how do we get that? And that's where we are really working to really ensure that the policymakers and the economic policies are in balance, in line with nature conservation. Next slide, please. So this is what we're doing. Next slide. We are working to create employment for the most vulnerable communities. And we're doing this through the production of, um, of systems or the setting up of systems that help to produce things like Brazil nut oil or roasted nuts, things that are really in balance with nature. We are working on blue carbon projects in the mangrove areas. We're working on um, implementing or at least introducing the concept of carbon financing, like carbon taxes, um, certainly with the, the, the new oil coming on stream, it's important that we tax these things appropriately. A whole range of other issues. Uh, we engage very deeply with both government, community, and with the private sector, in country and beyond. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Right. So 
There are a couple of very tangible opportunities right now. One of them is the fact that Suriname is setting up a national environmental fund. We are incredibly proud that that's happening, and we are looking forward to seeing how that can really help to channel funding from, for example, the carbon tax towards livelihood development, towards health projects, towards increasing resilience, towards climate change, but also other natural disasters, or let's say other climate related natural disasters that we're seeing happen more and more in Suriname. Certainly in the interior, we're seeing rampant flooding and we're seeing uh, complexities in terms of ensuring um, enough food, really. Food security is under pressure. Next slide, please. Next slide. And one more. Great. So I think the message that we'd like to, to leave here is that as we in the Guyana Shield and Suriname continue working with our policymakers, working with local companies. It's really important that we focus not on producing less or on less economic growth, but producing differently. How do we ensure green growth? How do we ensure that we maximize and utilize the wonderful natural capital we have without cannibalizing, without engaging in a parasitic relationship that will leave all of us uh, losing? And that's our journey, a journey towards green growth, more prosperity for our people in harmony and balance with nature. Thank you very much. And um, I'd like to leave it at that for now. Thanks a lot, John. Uh, I just also welcome Annette uh, Arjun Martins, uh, joining us from Ghana and we'll speak shortly. Um, I think what we wanted to do now following that is to again take another visual check in with the Ghana Shield. So we have a video of some of these landscapes that was produced by a Guyanese, um, a Guyanese production company called Real Guyana. So I'll ask for that to be shown now and then we'll move into uh, Annette's uh, discussion. Again, the question and answer um, section follows this session. So please write any of your questions into that uh, question and answer box. So I think we can show the video now. It really is a special place. Um, 
Our next speaker is uh, Anit Arjun Martins. Uh, she's been the champion of Guyana's coastal and marine ecosystems for close to 30 years, which is amazing because she's only 35 years old. Um, <laughs> but she's going to talk to us a bit about her work around coastal ecosystems and some exciting, um, exciting opportunities coming up. Go ahead, Anit. Right, so good morning, um, panelists. Um, apologies for being slightly late. That um, beautiful video, which was done by Real Guyana, gives our viewers a little snippet of a tiny part of the beautiful interior of Guyana. You would have seen the coastal landscapes, the um, hilly sand and clay, the savannas, the mountains. So as Damien said, I'm gonna use my time this morning to speak about our coastal land landscapes and in particular, our mangroves. And the reason I chose to focus on the mangroves is that in a time of climate change, sea level rise, a low line coastline like we have in Guyana, we are being severely impacted and the essential roles of the mangroves cannot be understated. So my short presentation um, is focusing on mangroves, which we consider um, nature's sea defense. And this first photograph shows um, very you know, aptly um, our coastline, which is seven feet below sea level, um, where 90% of our population resides and where 90% of our agriculture exists. And you could see that very thin strip of mangroves there. And imagine the very essential role that that mangrove plays in dissipating the energy of the waves. And <clears throat> so of course, it reduces the erosion of the coastline. Next slide, please. So these two photographs um, give you an idea of an area in Georgetown, which is heavily fringed by very thick mangrove forests which as I said earlier, acts as a buffer against very heavy wave action and protects the uh, investments behind the mangrove fringe. And then on the other side of the Demara River where the mangroves have been removed, you could see a recent photograph of where there was heavy overtopping and subsequent um, very heavy flooded, flooding, which impacted all of the infrastructure there, including the hospitals and the livelihoods of the people there. Next slide, please. These two photographs um, are recent photographs um, where an unfortunate breach in our sea defense. Guyana's coastal um, area is 431 kilometers, stretch along six regions. And in this region, uh, region five, there was a tiny breach that started um, in 2019. Unfortunately, the response to have it addressed was very slow. So by the time the funds were mobilized and the rem remedies uh, started, this breach had actually expanded to as much as three kilometers and over 50 million US were expended <clears throat> before it could have been sealed. Next slide, please. So what happened was the entire area was flooded, massive amounts of rich agriculture lands, which were used for rice and livestock grazing, was um, severely inundated. Of course, with the salt water, it was rendered useless. And the impacts, especially on the women farmers who depended on their livestock and poultry and duck, was really, really um, horrific. And this land, of course, is gonna take several years to re recover because before it could become arable again. So this is a classic case of, um, of, of you know, a very poor response, um, terrible consequences. And if mangroves were there, this would not have happened. Next slide, please. So mangrove restoration is not something that is new to Guyana. Actually in 2010, we had a very big uh, European Union funded pro, um, mangrove restoration program that ran from 2010 to 2015. And during that program, one of the first things that we did was we carried out a mangrove forest inventory 
And in 2010, we found that we had 25,000 hectares of mangrove forest. This is the black mangroves that's found mainly along the coast. The red mangroves are found along the rivers and the white mangroves are found in between. In 2019, Conservation International also had a mangrove program and their inventory showed that they had 34,000 hectares in 2019. So you could see it was a substantial increase from when the European Union and Guyana government funded projects started and um, to when CI did an inventory um, almost nine years later. Next slide, please. So we had a very massive mangrove restoration effort in the EU funded program, as well as other activities such as awareness and livelihoods. And what we did is we singled out mainly women, single parent women, who were trained in nursery protocols to grow the seedlings until they were 18 inches long, which ensured their survival in the areas where they were, they were replanted. And we gave out contracts of over 3000 seedlings per woman, which of course gave them um, 100 Guyana per seedling, which was of course put to beneficial uses, such as sending their kids to school, starting up small little businesses that could sustain their family incomes. Next slide, please. And in all, we planted over half a million seedlings along an 11 kilometer stretch um, of our coastline. The first photograph shows the men who were employed as well. The women grew the, the seedlings and the men would go out on boards in a line with about 50 seedlings on each board called a Moran and then plant them. So in all, 11 kilometers were replanted and 500 hectares were naturally regenerated because when these mangroves reached maturity in under in nine months, because mangroves of course grow very quickly, and this is why they are very important um, for their carbon sequestration functions, which is five times more than regular forests. So when these mangroves matured at nine months and they started to shed their seeds, the currents took those seeds down to areas where the mud elevation was just right. And there was also a very successful nat natural regeneration process as a consequence. And last check, we had over 500 hectares that had regenerated naturally from the mangrove restoration program. Next slide, please. So we were also very um, successful in having Guyana's first mangrove reserve declared along a five kilometer stretch. And the communities started up a low carbon tour, which was used um, with horse carts from the villages, taking visitors along the mangrove forested trails to learn about mangrove conservation, as well as we trained over two dozen women in beekeeping. And there was a little honey hut set up where visitors at the end of their mangrove tour could go and buy the beautiful mangrove honey and the beeswax candles. And this beekeeping was also very important because it was set up in the mangroves where people would not go and cut the mangroves down if their hives are there. So that in itself served as another protective measure. Next slide, please. Not very um, long after that initiative was set up, it won the Caribbean Tourism Organization's Biodiversity Conservation Award in 2012. And in 2013, it won the Guyana Tourism Authority Environmental Award. And you could see our present president, Irfan Ali, who was then the minister with responsibility for tourism, presenting that plaque to our head of that tourism initiative, which consisted largely of women once again. So we have a very strong gender agenda because um, the women, of course, are one of the most vulnerable part of our um, population that don't, don't have very much opportunities so we have a champion of mangrove conservation in our present president, Irfan Ali, which is a good thing for mangroves in Guyana. Next slide, please. We also had a massive environmental awareness program where we also developed a curriculum for teachers to be used in our schools. So we basically have a very environmentally aware generation. And these um, that young Guyanese especially are the most ardent defenders of mangrove conservation. Next slide, please. 
So presently, Guyana, it's a, at a very pivotal point of its development where with the massive fines of oil 190 kilometer offshore, we have very much infrastructure development going on. And of course, it's a consequence. There's some very important decisions that have to be made. So this photograph shows you the Demerara River, which is near our capital. On the east bank, you have the first shore base. And on the west bank, which is called Versailles, uh, this is slated for development as well to support the additional shore bases that are necessary. Next slide, please. So this is two photographs of the same area in 2020, where you see, like I said, Versailles um, fringed with mangroves. And then in 2021, um, 65 acres removed as a consequence of clearing for a shore base, uh, the second shore base that is needed. Because presently, Trinidad is being used for the shore base facilities. And um, of course, Guyana wants that investment and subsequent employment here. Next slide, please. Hi, Annette. Yeah. Hi, sorry to interrupt. We got a few minutes left. I, I don't know okay. if you wanted to wrap focus quickly. on. Yeah. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. I'm, I'm coming on to that. So next slide, please. So as I said, um, Guyana has to make some hard choices and we want to have environmentally responsible development. But another um, consideration is not only the mangroves that will be removed to have shore-based development, also um, Exxon's own oil spill modeling has showed that if there's an unmitigated oil spill, the currents will take that oil smack bang into Guyana's only coastal protected area, the Shell Beach protected area. And these photographs show the dynamic shorelines changing yearly. Next slide, please. But all is not lost because we have a very special area next to Guyana's only protected area called the Burima Mora Passage, which is inhabited by three of Guyana's indigenous peoples, the Waraus, the Caribs, and the Arawaks. Next slide, please. And here is the area um, demarcated by the red um, line, which was um, researched in 2019 and found to have over four species of IUCN red listed species, the jaguar, the puma, the manatees, and the otters, including giant anteaters. Who would have thought that you could find giant anteaters in mangrove forests? Next slide, please. So our suggestion with balancing um, development in the oil sector is to also ramp up the protection of special places where in this particular area, it has been ascertained that this is where Guyana's largest mangrove ecosystems exist. Next slide, please. So here you have the area um, that we are being proposed for protection and for nomination as a World Heritage Site to which our president has given his commitment that the government will support that nomination. You have the Warau communities of Embetero, Smith's Creek, Marijuana, and at Shell Beach. And this area is referred to as the Burima Mora Passage because that is where these two areas basically intersect. Next slide, please. So this is the nesting area where we have four species of sea turtles that come here every year from March to August. Next slide, please. Massive wetlands, incredible biodiversity, our ibises, flamingos, roseate spoonbills, to name a few. Next slide, please. And of course, the indigenous people that are the most ardent protectors of this environment, the waraus here, which they depend on the waters for their livelihoods, including living in the swamps and doing a lot of non-timber forest production activities. Next slide, please. And we don't need to reinvent the wheel because we already had a German Development Bank funded program where it supported alternative livelihoods for the communities that live within the Shell Beach protected area, which was massively successful. Next slide, please. So we're proposing that we look at how do we find suitable alternative livelihoods for these communities that live in this area. And there is a lot of medicinal oils that are being produced, which have immense value, especially in a time of COVID, where traditional remedies are being part and parcel of the, the, um, the fight against COVID in these very far-flung communities. Next slide, please. 
And this is a slide that shows the Warao community of Imbatero. It's right next to the border with Venezuela. And this area is also coming into a lot of threat because the massive influx of migrants from Venezuela are coming here and also clearing mangroves to put up your homesteads. Next slide, please. So we are proposing that we have a research tourism initiative that will add to the protection of this area. Um, of course, and to have the science done to enable it to be nominated for World Heritage Site status. Guyana is the only country in South America that does not have a World Heritage Site. And here you have a young female marine biologist from the area who's leading this team of researchers. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And that's the end. So we are saying that we already had two very successful pilots. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We could basically just look at ramping up these efforts and add into our already existing success story. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks a lot, Annette. Unfortunately, I think we're out of time. We had some another uh, video recording of a speaker we won't be able to play. So I believe we can um, go straight to questions uh, if we have any. All right. All right, well, I'd like to thank everyone for joining. Um, and I, I, I'm I, sorry we weren't able to hear from the last speaker, um, but CI, uh, both CI Guyana and CI Suriname are going to be speaking more about this work so you can stay tuned and we'll be partnering with the Guyana Marine Conservation Society, particularly on the postal work. So back to you in the studio, thanks a lot. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks to all the speakers. Really great points.